Uh, Alright, so we're going to talk about testing complex Python dependencies with Docker containers. So this is a kind of a strange edge case in testing that I suspect a lot of people have and they might have realized yet. So testing, um, try and figure out if the software does what you expect it to. I never was familiar with testing this alone. Uh, what do we mean by complex dependencies? So it's not a Python package. You don't have to test Python packages. You drive a web browser drive uh, some external piece of software that you have a medium documentation for or that your company bought and told you you have to feed or that does something that you can't replicate yourself. You depend on it and how are you able to check that it's doing what you want and you prevent that from ruining the rest of your environment. So we start with basic Python testing. I assume people are familiar with some uh, virtual and PyTest unit tests for lots of uh, test control and environment control packages. Uh, these give you wonderful tools for doing some things. I assume most people don't see that testing. You have to test it yourself. Right? So, what does a normal test environment look like in Python? You've got your code, which is driving some test package, test cases you've written, logic, conditions you expect. Uh, and that sits on top of whatever other libraries you've got. You have things that feeds to the Python interpreter, and everything's wrapped up in virtual end or whatever environment control package you want to use. Um, and you can recreate things, change things, adjust things as you want. So very, very simple test case. You discover that your version of some package is old. And you want to confirm that updating it won't break anything. So what you do, you update the version in a virtual environment. You rerun your tests. Everything works. Update, change your requirements file, whatever it is. Ready to move on. Very simple, and if it doesn't work, it's in a virtual end. It just doesn't cause a problem. You just delete it, go back, and start over and figure out what's wrong. But what if the thing that you depend on isn't just a Python package and virtual end doesn't have the ability to control what it's doing? So the basic problem is there's a bunch of state, there's a bunch of code, there's a bunch of stuff that doesn't touch the Python interpreter. So you can't expect any of the Python tools to really help you do this. You can write and run your tests, but if someone updates the version of the package on your computer, it's not the same test. It's not reducing. It's not done. It's not done a very good job of confirming things are behaving properly. So what does that actually look like? You've got a hole in your virtual end wall where your package in the external dependency talks to something else, a driver, a REST API, a server, a print package, a file, whatever. And that lives outside the wall that you're able to control. But you don't know what's happening. That external application over there on the side can do anything it wants. And you really have no idea. You don't understand the data that flows in and out through this little portal in your program, which is enough for you to complete your task, but it may not be enough for you to be sure it's behaving properly. This is a surprisingly common problem. So if you're using interpreters for other languages for some reason, all kinds of data processors, and they're really common things. So if you interact with MySQL in any capacity, you have another complex system that lives well outside. How do you test upgrading a version of a database and be sure that it doesn't break? Do you want to switch from MySQL to Postgres or Korea or whatever? How do you actually do that in a way that's safe and reproducible? You can roll back. And this one, lots of people trip over. If you use some process just to move files around for some reason, and the operating system changes the location of the copy command, it may not work properly. So how are you able to make some progress and control these things? You've got two core issues. Virtual end isn't able to control what you want. Python isn't able to control what you want. Because state lives outside. And then you've got some really evil software out there. So we've all got web browsers on our computers, and they update themselves. And you can't stop it. You can't install old versions. You can't go back. You can't reproduce. Actual testing, actual rollback, not available. Lots of commercial software. You can't have more than one version on a computer at a time, and you probably can't go backwards. And if you want to know what was installed on February 16th, no one's going to help you. The company that sold the software will just give you a fresh download again. If you patch the machine or whatever, that's your problem. 
You can't expect, again, a Python package to do this. A piece of software that's got nothing to do with the Python interpreter can touch the file system. It can do whatever it wants. Uh, web browser example, we've got cache files, history files, cookies, whatever. It can do anything that it wants. And the only sort of partial solution, such as it is, is to just rebuild your computer from scratch before every time you try to test this. Reinstall my SQL on a new computer and try to create versions. I don't think that qualifies as a solution for real. And it's not, in any sense, debuggable. So you can't run the working version at the same as the broken version. You may not be able to, without completely restarting your computer in the next afternoon, even figure out what's exactly the thing that you did. Okay, so we're going to talk about as our motivating case, just updating the version of the web browser, because everyone has had this problem at some point on airport Wi-Fi or Safari or whatever was the update. So you depend on a web browser for your software for some reason, and you want to do real testing. You want to have staging environment. You want to be able to roll things back. You want to be able to figure out what's broken, investigate the problem. And just hoping it will work when you hit that update button isn't any of those things. It's the real software. Uh, similarly, if your company owns a rents whatever, a piece of commercial software that you use, you may not be able to freely switch things back and forth. Your license may not let you do that. All kinds of other restrictions. Uh, so we want to do things correctly with a, or use a common piece of software. There. Okay, so brief sidestep on containers. Um, can I have a brief show of hands for who's familiar with containers? Docker or, okay, great. So, too much detail, it's a way of virtualizing or wrapping up a computer a little bit. I'm gonna focus on Docker containers just because that's a simple thing with simple setup that I guess most people don't on. And the key here is we're trying to achieve these goals in a testing environment, not at too much cost. We have one really expensive way, which is just build a totally independent computer each time, fresh versions of all the software. So it's important that we don't depend exactly where we're running, that it's an easy, lightweight thing that we can flip back and forth, debug, investigate. Okay, so simple solution, build your tests in containers. So the first thing you get here is clean state every time. So your web browser or whatever piece of software, these files, these cookies, whatever it is, it's all cleaned out next time you start it. You can control exactly what's running. Now this may be an issue if the package you depend on is some complex third-party thing. Are you able to install Oracle in a Docker container itself and know exactly what's in there? Probably not. But for stuff that you can install yourself and control, it's fine. The common use cases for containers are about deployment, cloud use, stuff that's running on a computer you don't know have any control over. We're thinking here about deploying something, similar issues, unknown cloud provider somewhere, but it's a test. Even if it's running on your own computer, it's running on your development machine, your development environment, you need similar types of controls to what you have just running anonymously. So what does our test setup now look like if we run our thing? in a container. We've got our setup as before, and now we've got an extra box around the outside and more control over the outside world. Now, notice we're not actually doing anything different. As far as this application is concerned, it has no idea. But at least we've controlled what it can do, and we've ensured that it's starting from a, a clean state that we've set up. Okay, so and this is very important. You can ban it from having network access, right? So if you don't want it to auto-update, or if you want to make sure that it's not looking something up somewhere else, that a piece of software that claims to do translation isn't just feeding Google Translate, you can be sure that's happening, which means it's a real test. If you run something and it's going off in network access you don't know about, it's not a real test because you have no prayer of controlling all the state that something with internet access can do. You can stop things that auto-update by just installing them in a container and then turning the container off. Uh, an analogy I was given from someone else a few days ago, if you've seen the Netflix show Altered Carbon, it's a bit like if you pull the thing out of the back of somebody's neck and the browser can't change itself anymore. It's often sort of cold storage, such as it is. You've still got all the regular Python stuff working fine. There's no limits, really, on what you can do. This doesn't curtail you. Okay, so it looked like most people were familiar with Docker.
get some tools that we need to help install things. We install Chrome. We get some other stuff that's needed to whatever run Chrome, a associated setup for our program. And then we set up our environment, again, controlled so that things will behave properly. People use Docker. Well, you do this, it gives you a container, and then you run whatever you need to run. Importantly, once you've got this for a dependency that you're testing, you can do things like this. You can pull it test, it's just to control this run Chrome. What do we actually do? So we're sure it's clean. We've got a portable persistent virtual in things that aren't supported by virtual in, sort of. Okay, what does a test look like? Similar Docker setup. We base ourselves on this image. Fine. We add whatever the speed our requirements, test, update, go back and forth. As usual, run that and our test code. So we build that up and we now have here, ready to run using unit test or whatever test package you're familiar with, a completely canned version with all the dependencies all the way down the stack. So this is some sort of pseudo code for an example, unit test. People familiar with unit test, pi test? Yes? Generally, okay. So you set up the thing on how to test the can confirm that it's doing what you want it to do. And this is going to run here, all canned up in a place that has a totally canned and controlled version of Chrome from, from here. So we can rerun this test case six months later and we know that it's exactly the version of Chrome that came out of this at this time. We can see what version it is, whatever we need to do later. Roll back. Okay, so we've got all of our dependencies on continue to use this thing in the future. That's exactly what you want out of a test. And this, this is where the power of this sort of simple observation comes. You can now run the new and old versions of Chrome that you depend on at the same time, or Oracle, or whatever data processing software, on your computer. And debugging, I mean, what does debugging mean for an external package? It probably just means print statements, because you really can't attach a debugger to this random other thing. But you can do some kind of investigation, as opposed to just update and hope for the best. You can try updating your base operating system version. This is not a complete operating system test, but you can rebuild this, then you rebuild your Chrome image, rebuild whatever test you have on top of it, and you can confirm, unless you're doing something really weird, this is probably fine. It'll make sure that the file copy stuff hasn't moved, environment variables are unset, the locale is different, and you have encode decode issues because UTF-12 or 16 or whatever is missing from the computer. All that becomes really clean, and it doesn't require you to wipe your laptop anymore. Okay, so we now have a way to run tests that's well controlled. But how to test something that you didn't write and you don't really know the internals of, that's different. The, the way that you approach testing this is maybe not the same as testing code that you wrote and spec yourself. So let's just step back for one second. Why would we use a large, ugly, complicated piece of software that we don't control? It makes life a lot worse, and we're going to end up, this is going to come up for a bit now, with a lot of duplicated state. So whatever it's doing, we have some shadow version in our software keeping track of what it's doing. And that, of course, is a bad idea. Duplicated state is something that you don't want to have. We've got here, over in our nice little Python sandbox virtual environment, some version of state that lives out here you know, maybe is leaking a bit if it's allowed to talk to the outside world. This is terrible. This is just bad software design. And it makes testing really difficult because we know what's here. We don't know what's here. What can we do to avoid it? Well, you could try to build the functionality yourself. 
presumably you depend on this package because you can't do that, right? Trying to write a web browser or whatever data processing software that your company uses, you probably can't do a better job yourself. And you're also likely not permitted to do it yourself, right? I mean, your company isn't going to be happy if you decide to write your own database because you think that's easier to test. That's not going to fly. Maybe if whatever you're using is really horrendous. But so you end up doing this when it's the least bad choice you've got, and then you have to you know, make do, move forward as much as possible. OK, so let's simplify that diagram from before a little bit. We've got some kind of states and state transition thing going on in two separate places. These look pretty similar, and we hope that they're pretty similar. But actually, this over here is a black box. We have no idea what's really going on here. So how do we approach making sure that our expectations of behavior here map over here? Oh, let me just select that. Well, one thing you can do is you can just try to push it through as many state transitions as possible. So you can attempt to build unit tests. You should have wrapped your dependencies. So you test that stuff as it is. And then you write things that are complicated and messy and maybe not normal test cases. Right? You normally want lots of simple independent test cases to make sure stuff works properly. And then you do your integration testing and everything later. Because we don't know what's happening, every time we come across a bug, a misunderstood behavior, some weirdness, that becomes one of our additional tests. Because again, we have no idea what's going on over here in this box. All we know is it's inside this cage. And it's going to do the same thing every time. If it's behaving differently every time, we need to start adding more and more cases, because it indicates we don't understand what's going on here at all. So this is important. When you develop unit tests or toss testing strategy for software, you want to make sure you've tested everything it's got. Here, you can't have completeness. Code coverage doesn't exist as a metric here, because you don't have access to the code. You don't even know everything it's doing. You only know what you want it to do. So you basically can just keep throwing more and more tests at it. Volumes available. There aren't a lot of other alternatives. Strange things that you then end up wanting to do. If you're looking at a package and you find some workaround for some problem, you misunderstood something, a way you do it doesn't quite work, that it fails in that way is now something you should test. Because that's some strange path through the state machine I mean, you sort of understand. You understand the behavior. If you have something that you think should work and doesn't, you need to make sure that it fails in the same way in the future. Because you upgrade version of the system, and your functional testing works. But three additional versions down the line, the functional testing still just breaks all of a sudden. Right? It works, it works, it works, it breaks. And it's because of an internal change that happened four versions ago. And now you have to go back and try and find you want to avoid doing that spelunking. And the easiest way is to have tests that things are broken or misunderstood in the same way repeatedly. Normally, you wouldn't think of that as something that you put in your, your test environment. Running these experiments, running these tests, doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything in time. You can run six containers on your laptop at the same time with different versions. It's not like you have to spin up more machines. You don't have to go set up any more environment. You're just writing, uh, however many slides back it is, you're just writing these little four or five line Docker files. Right? There's nothing complicated here. Um, you don't have to, yeah. Uh, where was I? OK. You want to keep all the containers you build along the way. And then we're going to come into container stack design in a moment, some strange things. You can't get old versions of lots of programs. Again, the web browser analogy is apt. You can't get four versions ago of Chrome. That, that's not a thing that you can install. But if you have a versioned history of your dependencies clean, you can now go back and you can figure out exactly when something broke and why, exactly which behavior changed at which time. However, that requires you to design your container stack in such a way that you can have dependencies. So the idea that your code sits at the bottom and then you layer things on top of it, that won't work. You may have several versions of your code at different places in your little container hierarchy that are a mess for deployment and keeping track of what's going on, but necessary to go back and take advantage of the reproducibility of old versions of the system. So we look here. You think of this. Oh, it's not highlighting well. If you think of this here as a standard 
you know, base OS, whatever packages and things you need, your code, and then the driver that functions on top. The dependencies are going to end up having to sit, at least for testing purposes, underneath your code, and your tests may, how do I say, you may have several different stacks to complete tests with different dependencies so you can isolate them. So if you've got a browser in here along with a database package and some other file formatting proprietary print scheme, whatever, you need to break those out into separate stacks so you can change versions because you may be able to go rebuild one container for one version that, you know, commercial software that they're delivering you individual versions of. If it's something, any kind of security patches, anything that updates itself in any capacity, you're not going to be able to go back and reproduce historical machine setups. I mean, imagine reproducing the way your laptop was three weeks ago exactly so that you can do software debugging. That's just not possible. All right. So the short point here, wrap complex dependencies in containers, not to clean up your deployments, just so that you've controlled what they're doing. And then you can use traditional Python testing tools. I used unit test. I've got examples for PyTest, whatever if people want to go through. Um, leverage them because you've managed to put a wall around the complicated container you depend on. And when you're designing your tests, think broadly about what are and aren't good functions to be testing. Simple unit testing for a complicated black box you're hooked onto may not be enough. All right, so think uh, more creatively about mistakes that you want to confirm still fail or weird paths that shouldn't work but do that you want to make sure still work in that way. I think that is the end of, yes, okay. So, questions? Yeah, thanks for this, this screen. How do you have the dev experience, like, you know, you, you are running your unit test in a uh, container, you can run your, you know, a bash shell in your container, but how do you, like, you know, spin up, let's say, an IDE, or, you know, your cafe, things? Okay, okay, so, I mean, if you're testing your software, using a container isn't really necessary because you control all the stuff and then you can run the IDE and the rest of it. What you're doing here is wrapping up a black box that you can't really attach an IDE to. Okay. So if just imagine you've got a problem in, I mean, again, the web browser example. I mean, you could try compiling Chrome yourself and attaching a debugger to it if you wanted to. You can compile MySQL yourself and run it in a container and attach a debugger if you want to. I mean, you're not going to do that, right? That's that's. <laughs> So if, if it's a case where you need to do that, hopefully your interaction with the complex dependency is mild enough that none of this is necessary. You want to isolate things. So this, again, is a big issue in t you know, broader test design thought. Try to separate your stuff so that your code that you control, you can use the proper tools and run your IDE and all those things. So in your workflow, you are writing code, writing a unit test, and then you will build that image and then run that test? So yeah. there's. Um, two basic tracks in testing, one of which is testing the software itself, and then one of which is testing the way it interacts with the outside world. And then there's integration testing and whatever above that. You, you can't, if you end up having to, I mean, when you update versions and discover something fails, it just ends up being print statements and good luck, because nothing else is, is realistic. Do you have a sort of an ideal, uh, let's say you have uh, 10 libraries, um, that doesn't mean that you create one for each uh, library update, right? Or, because if you, or do you have like, let's say for this container, I'll uh, have the upgrade for three uh, libraries. But if you have lots and lots, I think a lot of containers might yes. be hard to manage. So I guess, I mean, the answer is yes, of course, you really should have totally separate versions for everything because yeah. you're going to end up with a problem somewhere. Yeah. It's free, automated. Now, do I have every single thing I touch broken out in separate pieces? No, you try to group stuff and do the best you can. But you know someday you're going to end up with two things you stuck in the same container and skipped a version and there's a problem and you can't go back. Yeah. Right. So I, like, you know the answer. Right? It, 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 so, sorry, that's the way the world works. If you already used uh, Container or Docker, why do you still use uh, Python? So if you want to just test updating a Python version, uh, a Python package version, you can still do that. It gives great control over stuff that's fully Python. You can do that on the side. I mean, you could, you could do that too, sure. And, um, and actually, it's important to say, virtual environment is not, 
I mean, you can get around that border, right? If you have access to the C Python stuff and implement your own built-ins, you can sneak out any way you want. I guess you, you can sneak out of that. Virtual environment's not the, the strongest boundary. If you sneak out of that, you've just used C Python correctly. If you sneak out of the Docker container, that's a bug that somebody would like to know about. So you're far more likely to, you know, have a strong wall there. But yeah, it's you know, you could if you have a really badly behaving Python package, maybe you want to wrap that one in a container and run it on its own because you know, it, it can it can do weird things. It can access the network if you, you know, don't know about it. Yeah. Second oh, question. Sure. Uh, if we have a more than one service like perhaps uh, authentication and other things like con connecting to the database. How to test these two services? Can I wrap this in a single container? Okay, yeah, so for earlier, you can, you can fire the container up, launch a shell, and then build your test. If you need a complicated integration environment, you can, you can do that, sure. I mean, you can log in and run a, and I've written test code before that has sleep statements so the database can fire up and, I mean, that's not a great idea, but... It, uh, in the single container or just outside? So you can run them separately in the containers. You can control networking. So Docker's got a very rich ability to control what network stuff goes where. Okay. Uh, I'm just thinking out loud uh, because, but I haven't, I know there's tools for uh, beefing containers, container images. Um, do you know any other approach that uh, I can generate tests based on of yeah, I'm, and, and you're gonna have to diff the Docker files, right? I mean, it's not, um, these aren't, it's like somebody gave you a, a stripped binary and said, here, you know, figure out what's different. I, mm, it's not perfect, right? I mean, you can still shoot yourself in the foot. And, sorry. <laughs> I mean, you can try doing proper machine images if you want to go one step further down. You can't diff machine images, but you can, you know, launch the instance and go investigate exactly what's going on. You can do more investigation on that than a container, but it's a lot heavier and, you know, you've now got a lot more things to, to, to try to control. How do you suggest storing Docker containers? Okay, so, I mean, one version is you just run it on your development machine and there you go. That's not keeping an archive of your thousands of images is not going to work. Um, uh, presumably your company has some kind of cloud service it's using with a container repository. We have Amazon, you can put the stuff in the container repository. Your company might have its own container repository, whatever. Um, yeah, you, you start using up an awful lot of space on your laptop and have to delete that QCAL file all the time when you begin doing this. Um, yeah, that, that, that's unpleasant. Um, yeah, I guess when I say it's free, that's a little bit untrue because you do have to pay for that cloud container storage. It's not a lot of money, but if it's a lot of containers, it could turn out to be a real. Yeah. Okay, all righty. Thank you. I think we're actually slightly early.